the topic of parenting, racism, and raising the next generation, to be honest, it's really an honor for me to be presenting with Marguerite, who I look up to for helping me learn and develop as a parent and learning, help me understand where are my weaknesses and where I need to be working. Um, and so Jazakallah Khair for coming in from California. And I've also asked her that as I'm presenting, feel free to add on to what I'm saying. So the mic is right there. Um, just because, you know, the only way we're going to learn as a group is if we benefit from each other's strengths, right? And so part of the, this presentation is based on a conversation, one conversation that happened about 10 years ago. And that was a conversation, my husband runs a halaqa, and he used to run a halaqa with a young brother. And after attending one of these large Muslim events, um, he, we were discussing, and he, you know, he said, I love mass. I love mass a lot, because we're, you know, I'm very active in mass, husband is active in mass. And he said, I love mass, but I don't find my place in the organization, right? And to me, it, it, it got me at my heart, okay? Because this is an organization that I have dedicated many, many, many years. I'm not even count how many years. Um, and for something about the organizational culture, for him did not fit, right? And so then for me, as a member who is concerned about the community and the well-being, he said, he said, I love everything you do. There's a cultural element that I'm having difficulty connecting with. And so that conversation, that open and honest exchange resulted in us working together on a research study called Uplifting Black Muslim Youth. And in this research study, which spanned 10 years, more than 200 people were involved through focus groups, through um, inter surveys, community needs assessment, open exchange of ideas and thoughts, and you know, helping us identify our gaps and what are different issues. All of that, we came up with a number of resources. We came up with research studies. We did the research studies. We presented at different conferences. We came up with a book that is outside that you can see, and resources. But the thing for me, is I can do, be doing everything in the world. All this academic work is great. But if that's not impacting my kids, what's the point? Okay. What is the point if my children are not changing? And so I want to share with you a conversation that we had at home. One time, one of my children came home and was telling me about school. And she was talking about some conversation between two classmates at her school. And she was saying something like, well, you know, he was so-and-so, and he was talking to her, and you know, they're both African-American. And he said something about um, fasting, but I wasn't really sure what he was talking about. The name of the brother, the, the young man was some like Abdullah or something. And She's like, but, so I was like, oh, he's probably Muslim. She's like, oh, I don't know if he's Muslim or not. And I'm thinking to myself, I've just dedicated 10 years to understanding, and my own children are not aware of their biases. We need to do something about it. And so this is actually the reason why we really wanted to do this presentation today, because we may not realize that we have biases. And we have to acknowledge these biases. And what I really want to do is give ideas and suggestions of what we can do about acknowledging and addressing these biases and use those moments as teachable moments. And I was able to use that moment as a teachable moment and say, you know, look, did you recognize the bias that you had? Right? Did you recognize what was going on there? And use that not to put anyone down, but say, look, I struggle with this every day too. And so what I want to do is break it down in a little bit more organized way so that all of us can understand what we need to be doing and how we need to be doing it, inshallah. So let me start. And 
I want to start off with kind of a, I don't know what it's called, I'm not really a meme, but whatever it is called these days. And it's something that really resonated for me. It's for someone who is non-black. And it says, I don't see race. I'm a good person. Okay. So for those of us in the room who are non-black, right, oftentimes we do not feel we are racist. We think it's a matter of if you exhibit any behaviors of racism, it makes you a bad person. And so we don't, nobody wants to be a bad person. And so we automatically think, well, if we're a good person, because we obviously are, then we cannot be racist, right? But what that says and what that means is you're saying, I'm going to use my place of privilege, which each one of us has. I'm going to use my privilege to refute and deny the suffering of those who do not have white privilege, while at the same time erasing their personal history and cultural history. There's a lot in there, but I just want to highlight a couple things. Right? Oftentimes, many of us who are Muslim are thinking, well, I'm not white. For those of us, majority of us, many of us are not white. I may be Arab. I may be Indo-Pak. I may be this, right? But recognize, in addition, within our community, we have a hierarchy. We have a hierarchy, and we have to recognize it's there, and we need to use whatever privilege we have in our masajids, in our communities, and in our families that we need to do something and use our opportunity to make change. So I'm going to go quickly, because I was told I've got my halfway point, so I apologize. Uh, <laughs> I also want to share, um, share um, a hadith, a hadith Qudsi. Allah SWT reminds us, O oh my servants, I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden amongst you, so do not oppress one another. Oftentimes, again, again speaking as a non-black, <clears throat> we often feel like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not, it doesn't impact me as much, right? But it impacts all of us directly and indirectly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have forbidden oppression from myself. So he is not going to oppress and he is not going to allow for oppression. And so it becomes a matter of faith. And so he has made it forbidden against you, amongst us. So we cannot in any capacity oppress our brothers and sisters. And it's not just oppressing our black Muslim brothers and sisters, but when we are not taking the opportunity to see the beauty, to see the richness of African culture, West African culture, East African culture, understanding there, there are differences within the African American histories and recognize that it isn't the black Muslim community, it is multiple, diverse, unique, vibrant communities that we need to learn and get to know. Marguerite talked a little bit about, about racism and impact, but I want a little look at what is the impact on kids. It's not, not just talk. It has an impact on their mental health and their development. Marguerite talked a little bit about how she felt as a child and the fact that she remembers that incident so many years later. Right? It's still part of her psyche. It has an impact. That's happening with our kids. It's help, impacting their, their self-esteem. It's impacting their behaviors. It has an academic impact. It has an impact on the health and well-being. We're not recognizing the, the impact it has on their, their well-being and their future. Right? And so I mentioned about these two resources that we do have. The book is actually outside. One of the things that we have it available in print as well as ebook to make it as accessible as possible for everyone. And it's, it's currently available electronically if you go on their website and download it. But you have the book which has the basic principles, but what's critical for all of us here is to recognize that there's an implementation toolkit which takes each point and helps you actually implement it within your family, within your community, within your youth programming, et cetera, step by step. 
there's a lot in there, so please use it. I'm just going to go to one small portion of what we've talked about in, the, in there. So again, that, all that information can be gone on the website. That's the website address. And then there, we're sending thing, resources out on a regular basis on our other social platforms. So please go there and <clears throat> get those resources. But we talked, I, I talked a little bit about the internal bias that we often have, right? So I'm breaking up into two different sections. For those individuals who are black and those who are non-black. First thing is really work to identify your internalized racism, right? Because as Margaret was saying, we are exposed to so much negativity in the media, in the classroom, in the books that we read, in the movies that we see, the messages, even in the framing of, of the news articles. So much information is sent over and over again that you develop a negative sense of self-esteem, negative sense of your race. And so many, many of us, are, have this understanding of negativity and association negativity with blackness. So those of us, those who of you who are, who are black and Muslim, it's really important that you identify yourself, the, re, the negative identity that you may have developed over time, and help your children identify that within themselves. Right? And so it's really important that as parents, of black Muslim youth is really important to nurture pride in their black Muslim identity, just as we do in any other culture. But I'm saying it intentionally because sometimes we develop this sense like, oh, we can't do it. But why is it we can't do it for just black Muslims? Why is it okay for me to be of Indian origin, to be proud of my Hyderabadiness, and not okay for someone to not be a proud of their black Muslimness, right? And so as black, Muslim, as black Muslim parents, you also need to provide opportunities for representation in the toys, in the clothes, in the activities, in the places you go, the people you're with, that representation matters. Similarly, for non-black Muslims, we need to identify our bias, right? And it's a process. It's not an on and off switch. I'm still learning. I, I've been doing this at least for 10 years, if not more, right? I'm still learning every single day some of my biases. And part of that is recognizing, yes, this is a bias. Now, what am I going to do about it, right? And so going back to the example that Marguerite gave um, about the inferiority and superiority complex, let me ask most of you who are in communities which have multiple different races, what do you usually have for iftars? Arab food or desi food, right? How often do you have soul food? Never. That's an example of the inferiority and superiority complex, right? What food is okay? What cultural forms of expression are okay? Clothing, music, entertainment what is acceptable, what is not. Those are our biases that we have. We have to acknowledge them, because if we're not acknowledging them, there's nothing we can do with our kids. And as we acknowledge them, we need to help our children acknowledge them and own it. I'm not going to know everything, because I'm not experiencing it every day as a non-black. But I have to use the experience and the wisdom and the guidance of people like Marguerite to help me understand. And I'll give you an example. On, those of you who are on social media, oftentimes people will say things. And then all of a sudden, all of these individuals who are black Muslim leaders will say, this is wrong. This is inappropriate. This is hurtful. And then so many other social justice warriors will come and say, no, 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 you're making something out of nothing. This is nothing. You just, and then shut down the other person. Take a break. If you are seeing so many people saying this, ask yourself, what's going on here? Is there an opportunity for me to learn? Is there something that I'm not getting? And learn, as a non-black, you have not had the same experiences. You need to take the experience from somebody who's dealing with it on a regular basis. I'm from Michigan, close to Flint. 
Now, if someone in Anaheim, Florida, tells me that the Flint water crisis is not a big deal, am I going to listen to them? No, they're not directly impacted. But someone in Flint is directly impacted and is seeing the impact and is dealing with the issues. It has to deal with the ramifications. I'm going to listen to them before I ask someone in Anaheim, right? So similarly, let's think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So our internal bias, so we need to actively work to correct it. And so with our children, like I had the conversation with my daughter, I said, look, you know, you, know, you, you said this, do you recognize what you said, right? And you're not putting them down. Okay. You're not putting them down, but what you're saying, look, I too have biases. I too make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, but you need to do something about it. You need to recognize and you need to change your behavior and help us realize what's going on. So I am going to skip, uh, I don't want to skip this microaggression. Um, I will just say one thing. Using that example of, um, Oftentimes, we may not be racist directly, but some of the things that we say or we do can hurt individuals. Take that as an opportunity to listen, understand, and grow. These are growth opportunities. Don't take it and put yourself defenses up. And when you do recognize it, um, again, this resource is online. I went over time and I apologize. It's something I'm very passionate about, obviously. Um, but when you recognize that you have these biases, you need to do something about it. And that's micro-resistance, right? We need to take the opportunity, especially those of us, if we are in a place of power or privilege or we have the ability to say something, say something. We have to say something. We, can't, we can never, no longer not say anything because we have to be allies in this. We need to identify this happened, this makes me uncomfortable because X, Y, and Z, and how about we do it some way? Or how do, how, what is another way we can do it? Because this is not good for our community, it's not good for our kids, it's not good for our, uh, anybody's betterment. So really use this opportunity and practice at home. Encourage each other, and this happens within our family because again, you know, the racism was, is within us, it's in our blood, it's impacted all over the place. When we are able to learn to call out each other in a respectful way and say, you know what, I don't appreciate the way you're talking this way because it has these implications. You've modeled for our kids how to talk about, how to address sensitive issues, hurtful issues, and do something positive with them. <sighs> okay, so. I'm sorry, I just will do one more thing. Um, and still uh, love and connection. Two major things, we need to create a knowledge opportunities. And again, there's a whole section on the, on the website about all the different knowledge things in terms of knowledge areas where we can help our children grow. But then we also need to provide experiences for both Muslim and non, non for both non-black and black Muslim youth, making sure to go to have spaces where individuals are exposed to black Muslim spaces, both non-black Muslim youth as well as black Muslim youth. Because in those spaces, you learn to appreciate blackness. We just went, my, I've been going to the Black Muslim Psych Psychology Conference for the last six, five, six years. This year, I finally took my kids because they're old enough to enjoy and benefit. And subhanAllah, I can see how much my daughter has really benefited from it. She really appreciates, she's like, Mama, can I go back again next year? Right? Then you, you get exposed to things that you never get exposed to. And again, I'm I apologize, I went over. But two resources where what I talked about goes into so much more detail than I was able to get to. The research book, which is outside, and then if you go online, the implementation toolkit. I do want to share some additional resources. Um, you have Muslim Arc, Sapello, Muslim Wellness, and Yakin. They all have t different topics, uh, different resources available to help you in this implementation process. Um, and I also wanted to let you know a little bit more about the work that we're doing at the FYI. This was an issue that a community member brought up to us, and we discussed it, and then we figured out, okay, we need to do the research. We spent 10 years of doing research. And then we took that research, to develop resources, and this is example. This the book, and the toolkit, and these talks are all part of bringing that awareness to the community. So, what can they do about it? Um, and I wanted to also share with you 
Um, one of the things that we're trying to do in this process is produce these resources, such as the book, as well as infographics. Now, this infographic was sent out to every single community, almost every single community in the nation that is active, right? If your community does not have this up, please contact us because it was sent, it was free, and we want to make sure it goes up in your community to help reduce mental health stigma. So you can talk to Sarah in the back. Sarah, can you raise your hand? Right. Sarah in the back, she'll see, help you figure out who has that poster in your community and please put it up. And um, I, I ask you that we spent 10 years to understand this issue, this topic, helping you to provide resources to the community to help ad address this issue of racism within, within the Muslim community. And I ask you that you do these, use these resources and um, to support the work through donation as well as using the resources. Jazakallah khair, and I apologize profusely. Um, one of the recommendations that I have is we have khutbahs on this on a regular basis. We have programming in the masjid directly and dragging your parents to that because you may not, you have the conversations and if they constantly are saying that's disrespectful, one what additional way you can do is bring them to masjid activities and encourage those masjid activities on a regular basis. That's one way of doing it. Um, also poten potentially having, having a, a, um, family friends who may not have those views have those conversations with them and ask them to bring it up if you're not able to. So, so Sarah asked me to um, remind you, Sarah's in the orange over there, if your community has not received the mental health stigma post infographics out there and have not received these postcards, please contact her in the back. We have a list of all the communities that received it. If you did not have, have it, we have some resources still available for you. But these are free for your community. There is a question about mental health stigma. This is how we're trying to reduce mental health stigma because, like I said, racism has an impact on the mental health and well-being of our community. And this is one example that we can all work together and uh, help reduce that, inshallah. Jazakallah.